Um, welcome to the first of a series of public lectures by the Foundation for Liberty and Prosperity. Um, I am Maria Cecilia de la Cruz. I am the current president of Ateneo, the Ateneo Center for International Economic Law. Basically, we're a student organization that seeks to um, produce research research oriented output for which 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 focus which focuses on international economic law. So our org is basically basically geared towards achieving also liberty and prosperity through through having um, critiques on important international policies and negotiations. So I will be your host for this morning. And before we officially start, um, please rise for the Philippine National Anthem.
So again, good morning, everyone. And this is the first public lecture of the Liberty and Prosperity Foundation. So without further ado, for the opening remarks, let me call on our Associate Dean for Student Affairs at Ateneo Law School, Attorney Giovanni Valente. It's uh, refreshing to see law students this early. Lawyers only come early when there's, heat, uh, when there's a hearing or when they're really required to come. <laughs> Chief Justice Artemio D. Pangiban, Chairman of the Board of the Foundation of Liberty and Prosperity, Chief Justice Hilario G. Davide, Member of the Board of Trustees of the Foundation for Liberty and Prosperity, Mr. Aniceto M. Spritenia, President of the Metro Bank Foundation, Dean uh, Nilo Tidina of the University Faculty of Law, and our very own Dean Andy Bautista of uh, the FEU uh, College of Law and the FEU Lasalle Las 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 um, Law and the FEU. Esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The Foundation Group for Liberty and Prosperity was formally organized on October 27, 2011 by Chief Justice Artemio V. Pangliban to perpetrate his core judicial philosophy that jurists and lawyers should not only safeguard the liberty of our people but must also nurture their prosperity under the rule of law. As its first project, the Foundation is sponsoring 10 professional chairs in the nine leading law schools in the country and one in the Philippine Judicial Academy. The project is called the Chief Justice Pangliban Professional Chairs on Liberty and Prosperity and is co-sponsored by the Metro Bank Foundation and also supported by the Metro Pacific Investments Corporation. One of the recipients of this award is our very own Dean, Dean Seth Free M. Candelaria. The Atelier de Manila School of Law is honored to host the very first public lecture of the Justice Pangliban Professional Chairs on Liberty and Prosperity. The Atelier de Manila School of Law is doubly honored that the very first lecture will be given by its very own. Now our very own dean will be the first lecturer, I think, is not because the Ateneo comes as one of the first law schools alphabetically. I wonder could it be that our very own dean was chosen first because the Ateneo Dean Rita School of Law in 2011 was conferred an award for excellence in legal education by the Legal Education Board of the Philippines for ranking first among the 10 best law schools in the bar examinations from 2001 to 2010. I think this very discerning audience knows the answer to that question. It is our hope that this first public lecture will inspire our lawyers, our students, to strive for the Ignatian virtue of magis, which is not just doing more, but doing more for the greater glory of God. It is hoped that with this lecture, 
and the other lecturers that will follow, lawyers and students will not only be contented with just reading their course requirements or doing their work in their offices, but also to engage in research and in producing outstanding academic and legal work like the lecture you're about to hear. So I'd like to welcome all of you to the Ateneo Law School and um, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Attorney Valente. So may we now call on Mr. Aniceto M. Sorbenia, the president of Metrobank Foundation. Chief Justice Pondiva, Justice Davide, Dean Selfie, Dean Divina, and Dean Andy. Magandang um, mga po sa ating lahat. In 2004, the Metrobank Foundation entered into a partnership with the Philippine Judicial Academy or FILJA of the Supreme Court to establish a professorial chair program. Together, we eventually conferred chairholders from different fields of law. In fact, I remember one of the uh, lectures done here also in this building. This joint undertaking with FILJA and the Supreme Court paved the way for the conduct of eight professorial lectures and two rollout lectures, which were delivered to students, law educators, and law practitioners. Our last rollout lecture of the FILJA was done at the Ateneo de Davao University, in fact, a month ago. We have always held the judiciary being one of the pillars of democracy in high regard for it safeguards the liberty we enjoy as citizens of this country. The judiciary, along with the executive and legislative branches, forms the synergy by which good governance and equitable growth are the ultimate goals. However, this task is not solely for the government, it's not solely for the government's responsibility. Good governance, as we all understand, is a product of community effort where individuals and different sectors engage and work together to achieve its goal. We have witnessed how the private sector that has always advocated for transparency in government played its role in generating support from our citizenry. We believe that while we strive for business success, we also share the responsibility of discovering opportunities to impart knowledge essential for the growth of our nation. Metro One Foundation has always believed that there is power in knowledge and that continuous learning is a key ingredient to professional excellence. We do this by strengthening key professions, especially teachers, soldiers, policemen. We help educate the public on relevant issues involved in public service, in medicine, and in law. Aside from our current partnership with FILJA, we are greatly honored to have taken part in another milestone endeavor, this time with the Foundation for Liberty and Prosperity. FLP is one of the 50 development partners chosen by Metro Mac Foundation as we celebrated the 50th anniversary of our bank. We were equally gratified to have served as host last night of the formal launch of the Chief Justice Panganiban Professorial Chairs on Liberty and Prosperity. The program is a reflection of the twin judicial philosophies important to Chief Justice Panganiban, who is also the chairman of the board of our advisory board of the Metrobank Foundation. We share with him his twin philosophy of safeguarding liberty and at the same time nurturing our people's prosperity. On a personal note, I wish to take this opportunity to congratulate my very good friend, Dean Sedfri, as one of the first recipients of this chair. I look forward to listening to an enlightening talk and open forum. I also 
would like to thank our group chairman, Dr. George SKT, uh, for leaving the Metrobank Foundation in this undertaking. To our colleagues in the Ateneo Law School and the Foundation for Liberty and Prosperity, rest assured that the Metrobank Foundation will remain steadfast in promoting a culture of excellence. And as I heard earlier by uh, our Associate Dean, that is also the one that is being promoted here in this law school. We will continue to engage more like-minded organizations like the Ateneo Law School and the FLP and institutions uh, represented by uh, UST and FEU, by their deans of uh, law schools present, in the pursuit of Metro Bank Foundation's philosophy of empowering our partners as well as the communities we work for nation building. Metrobank Foundation is not just a philanthropic organization. We have always believed that our work is to help build our nation. And we are happy to be associated with this very important endeavor this morning. Thank you, Mr. Solomon, for that wonderful message. Um, now we also we'd like to call on another honored guest, um, Chief Justice Hilario G. David Jr. as Chairman of the Governance Committee of the Foundation for Liberty and Prosperity.
it is not by accident that Dean Candelaria is the first to lecture on the program. He is highly qualified to talk on the subject. Above all, he is the dean of the best law school in this part no. of the country. <laughs> Outside of Billy <Bilman. laughs> Of course, uh, the other deans in Lubina, Dean uh, Bautista, would not agree to this and would strongly assert that the choice was based on the alphabetical order. <laughs> Besides, uh, for obvious reasons too, our the Justice Ascuna will not concur with the observation. He was still one at the Mayor of School, the Bates. Anyway, my friends, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. <laughs> Let me put an asterisk. Probably you remember during the canvassing of uh, the returns of the Islamic election, the speaker uh, in Yigas only said, asterisk, asterisk. The asterisk is this. Our constitution guarantees the liberty of our people and lays the foundation to achieve prosperity, progress, and peace. One of the framers of this constitution is Dean Emeritus Father Joaquin Bernas. He was the first to publish a book for the 1987 constitution and wrote the most authoritative book in the of the 1986 constitution writers. You ask him anything about liberty and prosperity, and uh, I'm sure, for the constitutional basis, therefore, Father Bernas will give you the best answer possible. And uh, even under the multiple choice risk and tricks, he was, he could expound more on liberty and prosperity, more perhaps than the RSP. <laughs> Liberty and prosperity is the core judicial philosophy of Chief Justice Kalani. It is explained and amplified in his book of the same title, Liberty and Prosperity, his last book as a sitting member of the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Kalani was the most prolific writer among all the justices ever appointed to the court since 1901. 173 justices have so far been appointed to the court, 24 of them, including the current Chief Justice, who is a product of the UP College of Law, became Chief Justice. Every year from 1995 until his retirement on 6 December 2006, Chief Justice Paganiba published a book to celebrate the anniversary of his membership in the court. He had written a total of 11 books. He had written the 246-page decision in the case of the Bugar Bilahan versus Rama, upholding the constitutionality of the Mining Act of 1995, the longest and most substantiated ruling in the 104-year history of the Supreme Court. The decision is itself. <laughs> Justice Panaliban declares that, of a quote, we must aspire to attain two loftier goals. One, safeguarding the liberty and two, nurturing the prosperity of our people. These twin weapons of liberty and prosperity constitute my core judicial philosophy. Close quote. The judiciary, he asserts, of a quote, can contribute to the advancement of liberty and prosperity by adopting two standards of judicial review as follows. One, in litigation involving civil liberties, the scales should weigh heavily against the government and in favor of the people, particularly the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, the dispossessed, and the weak. Two, 
in countries affecting prosperity, development, and the economy, the parents must be accorded to the political branches of the government. This approach is more widely known as deferential interpretation of laws and executive action. The Foundation for Liberty and Prosperity seeks to promote peace between parents through various programs, among which is the professorial team. This first public lecture will thus provide us a great chance to know more about liberty and prosperity. So let us lend our ears and open our minds to the words of being candidate. Thank you and God bless. Um, for that engaging message that definitely woke us up, especially those of them have. Um, so may we now call on our beloved dean of the Ateneo Law School, Attorney Sethi Candelar. The Honorable uh, Chief Justice of the Union. The Honorable uh, Chief Justice Larry G. Davide Jr., Mr. Inserto Enzo Perpeña, whom I call with an endearment term, San Cochito. You have to inquire later on. To the two very distinguished deans and co chairholders uh, in Nilo in uh, in Andy Bautista. Um, Attorney Vanny Valiente, my very loyal associate team, whom I call my uh, sweeper. My co-faculty and uh, co-workers in the vineyard of learning, uh, Professor Cecil Mejia and Professor Harry Sulaka. My law students, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I take this opportunity first, of course, the, uh, to congratulate the uh, Foundation for Liberty and Prosperity, including Future Bank Foundation, for picking up this opportunity to engage the law schools. It's a very timely opportunity for us because it is a time when I think legal education in this country is fast developing. Last year, we had a convocation in legal education where an invitation was sent to various law schools around the country where we discussed the developments in legal education. And in preparation for that convocation sometime last year, we found out that uh, it was almost 30 years ago that the last convocation in legal education was done at the UP Law Center. 30 years had made a lot of difference. Today we have a JD program and most law schools are encouraged, in fact, mandated to go to a JD curriculum. The JD program was introduced at the Ateneo Law School in 1991. It was a little faith, a leap in the dark for us. Then, being a part of the Los Angeles, we tried to embark on a program probably within the same cut as a JD program in the United States. But the JD program in the Philippines would take a different complexion of the earth because of the legal culture, the history, and the experience of this country. And this is what is very important to define the legal education and culture that we need to bring into this context. The context of liberty and prosperity is one that perhaps comes close to the experience of citizens mm -hmm. right now. As we have listened to Chief Justice David's introduction of Chief Justice uh, Omniban's philosophy, it is very much embedded in our Constitution. When the subject matter was actually raised to us at the breakfast meeting at the House of Chief Justice Omniban, that they will launch or do a roadshow on liberty and prosperity. 
I did not hesitate to volunteer immediately, a subject matter that I think will put this whole discussion into a framework. And I take into account, of course, a standard decision of the Supreme Court, Canada versus Sankar, as a starting point for us in the constitutional law one, and now on review by the court here. It's a landmark decision, not only because it was penned by the Justice on Niva, of course, but it gives us a framework on where our lives are now, in a sense, put into the hands of international economic institutions. Our first initiation, of course, into international economic institutions is the World Trade Organization. And that is where Tanyada begins to initiate us into the set of rules that govern states today on law, governing international finance, trade, and even development. The WTO case is important from the point of view of international law. It affirms a principle that finds automatic application or incorporation, as you have probably been answering in exams, the doctrine of incorporation related to pacta sunt servanda. The obligations must be complied with in good faith. And that is where I'd like to begin my discussion, because it is not very easy to appreciate, in a sense, the so-called role of most of the international organizations today. For one, I show you a picture here that says, no to EU austerity, yes to democracy, no to privatization. This is a scene somewhere in Europe. And for anyone who does not perhaps understand a topic in the very first place, we always say, it sounds great to me. And this is exactly where I would like to bring you today. To bring you back to where the cycle of sovereign debt crisis had begun. It began in the doors of Europe at one time because it was, in fact, where the leading nations began. And it took a cycle when the developing country borrowers and today lands back into the heart of the Eurozone. We have countries now in the Eurozone like Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, and mind you, Spain, our former colonial masters, in sovereign debt. How does this relate, in a way, to liberty and prosperity? My entry point is a subject matter that's, again, very close to my heart. I must admit, Mr. Chief Justice Nomiba, that when I took this lecture assignment, I said, you have given me an opportunity to refresh what I have, in a way, embarked on more than 25 years ago when I did a graduate research on the sovereign debt problem of developing country borrowers. But that was the scenario at the time. You had several sovereign debt crises, financial crises in Asia in the 90s. Then you had the slump in the United States that triggered, in a way, the Eurozone crisis in 2009 to 2011. For a while, I have had some reflection on this, I said, when will I have the opportunity to write another chapter in this original research that I think I may have to sort of put a dot on? And you just gave me the opportunity to start Chief Justice. And now I'm more tempted to embark on a book after this. <laughs> so um, I'd like to begin by giving you a short outline of what I plan to do. This will now be the start of a more legalist language. Pardon to non-lawyers, but I think it's something I'll try to put down on the level of a layperson's knowledge. Economists would be very, very much at home anyway with the language. And I'm sure uh, Sukuchito would be comfortable with 
debts he would be, have a lot, in fact, to share on matters of national economic policy making. I entitled this Understanding the Institutional and Functional Role of the International Monetary Fund During Sovereign Debt Crisis Situations. I begin with just doing a little survey of how sovereign debt crises have actually been with us since time immemorial, as they will say in the context of ECRA. It's been there with us, it will be there to stay. The question is, how do we cope with it? It's like the floods in Manila, the floods in the region. And in climate change, we say adaptation. How do we adapt to certain situations? Are there immutable rules right now that can actually be put in place that will deal with the ravages, let's say, of an economic disaster or financial crisis? How do we protect people in that context? How do we adapt to the situation? So the second major discussion is where I'd like to spend a little more time working through the history of IMF involvement on sovereign debt renegotiations. I will look at the parallels from the early stages of state insolvency and reaction of the international community to how debtor countries are actually, quote unquote, made to behave uh, in the pre-World War and the post-World War, where the IMF, together with the three grand Bretton Woods institutions, that played a role in trying to keep the world economy at bay. And then move towards the new era of crisis. And how IMF now would now have to be dealing with certain countries that are very, very protective of their sovereign rights, such as the Asian tiger economies, including, of course, now, Eurozone, where you have perhaps one of the most sophisticated regional organizations that had reached its pinnacle of integration through a common currency or a monetary union. That, perhaps, is the height of any integration of any economy. Once you reach that level, we have been trying to do that in Asia, an Asian currency unit. We don't know whether we will see the day when that will come. The last point will be some conclusions that will make some reference to human rights standards and how we can actually achieve in the context of what we call adjustment programs respect for fundamental economic rights of people without having to sacrifice civil political rights. The picture I showed you is typical of a reaction of a body politic that will have to undergo austerity programs. That is the experience of many developing countries in the past, when adjustment programs had to be required for purposes of actually uh, reconstructing economies that are emerging out of what we might call the financial crisis. It hurts. It hurts to rebuild an economy, especially in other situations like transition societies. We have countries, and Fortunately, at least for us, no? we have countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, that experience a stream of authoritarian rules, strife. And the question has often been raised, or a question has often been raised, if a new government emerges, a new state emerges, can that state actually run out of its obligation, walk away, a bad debtor, you know that from a very private perspective, from a very personal perspective, that will be very, very difficult. You have to be a good debtor. You will no longer get infusion of your funds in the end. And that applies not just on a personal level, but even on a state-to-state -state level. But the temptations are very real for a government that wants to survive, for example. Governments rise and fall sometimes in the context of deep economic crisis. And this is what happened to Greece, as you know. 
in an effort to implement certain austerity measures, the first government that had a hand on it did not survive. A new government had to rise. We have other examples in other parts of the world. So this is what I'd like to begin with. As a very young lawyer, after the bar exam in 1984, I told myself uh, there's something I'd like to really study when I go out there to graduate course. And I said, I want to make sense of what the activists at that time during the Marcus era were saying, down with IMF, down with World Bank, down with WTO, or IPO, uh, that at the time. And I said, you know, as a lawyer, if I want to be engaged in a very fruitful discussion on this matter, I really will feel inadequate unless I really study very well the consequences and the roots of this. I'm not an economist by background, but the nature of the issue that I had to deal with at the time was very much economic-based, finance-based. And for a lawyer, of course, getting into this realm is like going into a line of sanction. It's, uh, it's like mathematics. No? Yeah. That's why most of the lawyers, uh, they say, would want to go to law school to avoid one plus one. But I said, no, I think I will get help anyway. So I had the benefit of uh, an economist uh, advisor at the time, probably international law advisor also, and a whole set of multidisciplinary exposure. And that's where I think I got my own orientation that when you study law, you just cannot be confined with the technical rules of law. You have to look at the foundation of the law. You have to look at the rational behind it. And that is where law becomes more meaningful. That is where law actually makes sense in the lives of people, in the lives of states. Because law is an evolving instrument. With that, I now would like to proceed with a little introduction on the history of insolvency. Um, if one were to look at the history of international relations, there are at least very interesting models that we can look at on how the international community has dealt with insolvencies in the past. Very often, people ask, uh, does a state really go broke? Can a state, in a very theoretical and legal sense, go broke? We say no, because a state has all the grand powers. It has the power to tax. It has the power to generate revenues if it wants. However, the impact on the citizens is what will make a government think about using such kind of power, for that power has to be reasonably applied. And therefore, can a state really go through? Well, we say yes in the end, that there are countries who are unable to service, for example, its debts, it's in deep balance of payments deficit, then that's perhaps a situation which we call getting broke, when you are no longer able to pay your financial obligations. There was a time in the international community's history that the use of force was in fact used to exact contractual debts. You know, some of the bigger countries at the time had to send their forces, the US would send their marines to actually exact contractual debts of some of the smaller Latin American countries. But the hate peace conferences at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century banned the use of force to exact contractual debts. And even the United Nations Charter already bans the use of force for aggressive purposes. So that was at the time. What was the model during the uh, post-World War I and before World War II? Well, we had bondholders at the time. And what they did was to negotiate. There were negotiations that happened between the debtor and the private bondholders at the time. That was perhaps the closest you can find that will be equated with a model that will develop after the Second World War under the auspices of the International Monetary Fund. We also have another
third template that dealt with non contractual debts but more public obligation, like the German model when it had to pay certain debts after the First World War. And it was based on a treaty. So there was a multilateral arrangement with Germany to pay its debts through a multilateral model. That again will ring a bell looking at the post-World War II situation where a group of creditors called the Paris Club group of creditors would deal on a multilateral level. And then came the post-World War II, and this is where I'll spend, as I said, a little more time looking at how the International Monetary Fund had put together a framework to deal with sovereign debtors, uh, particularly developing country borrowers. The Asian financial crisis, again, is of interest, simply because it hit what we call tiger economies this time. Tiger economies in Asia um, would count Malaysia, you have Thailand, you also have Philippines and Korea. It's been one of the fast developing economies in East Asia. Again, we will see how the Asians reacted on the, uh, let's say, uh, participation of China in having to settle their problems. And finally, we will end with Europe, where I think the latest model you will find in sovereign debt crisis had adopted, in a way, what the IMF began after the Second World War. But of course, with much caution, because Europe, Europe is a continent that is very proud of its tradition, of its independence as an integrated community. And it will have a very on how a model in the Eurozone will actually develop. So this is what I just want to wrap up the uh, first and uh, in the uh, pre-19th century, these are at least the points that I'd like to leave you with. There is a term called readjustment plan. The debtor state is given an opportunity uh, rather than walking out of its uh, obligation to readjust. Diplomatic protection, of course, is always made available to private bondholders. In international law, the uh, debts, for example, for the obligations of a private citizen or a juridical entity uh, that actually are owing from the, let's say, a state party, would actually resort to what we call diplomatic protection. So if you're a bank, uh, you would want your country to raise that up as an issue with a government that owes you certain obligations. But that is because on an international plane, you are talking of an arrangement that does not have the status of a treaty between two parties. And therefore, your resort will probably be less of an international remedy. That's why you would have to resort to diplomatic protection. As I mentioned, the closest I will find where there might be a so-called legal consequence for a state for non-compliance with a multilateral financial obligation is to a treaty model. Because if you ask the state to sign this settlement in the context of a treaty, then you would have consequences pursuant to treaty law. And if the party fails to comply with that, then you can bring that party before an international tribunal. Um, but this was because during the, that time, before the Second World War, we did not have, let's say, an integrated world economy where you have institutions like GATT, WPO, Bitcoin, or World Bank, or IMF, that will actually offer opportunities for dispute settlements before going to an international tribunal. Let me move more particularly into the International Monetary Fund, including the other economic institutions. Okay. After the uh, well, just, because, just before the end of the Second World War, there were two major countries, of course, leading a meeting in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, that is the United States and England at the time. They led the Allied countries to deliberate on how to reconstruct 
the world economy after the Second World War. That was a major concern for the two countries. And we will see where the United States on one hand and Britain on the other had differed on approaches when it came, for example, to the use of the International Monetary Fund resources in dealing with the financial crisis of their members. Just by way of background, of course, in the parents to Anyada versus Angara, it's good to know that uh, one of the three grand institutions at the time that was intended to govern trade between states, that's the exchange of goods and services, by providing a set of rules, was the International Trade Organization. That did not materialize, as we know. The agreement that governed it was the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and because at one time the United States did not also favor an ETO at the time, what happened was the Secretariat remained to be the governing body for purposes of implementing the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Later on, in the Maastricht Treaty, as we know, in the 90s, the WTO would enter into force, and you now have a world trade body that has a dispute settlement mechanism. The other institution that was created during the Second World War was the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The NPRB at the time was really intended to provide assistance to countries um, rising out of the war, and they would need infrastructure development. So World Bank was really conceived as a development institution that will deal with infrastructure. You build dams, bridges. But World Bank has evolved since then. It even went into matters like structural adjustment loans and also governance issues. It has evolved from that time on. But the International Monetary Fund, in a way, remains stable and focused in its mandate. It is one that was supposed to govern, of course, uh, the regulation of exchange you know, and um, money, for example, would have been the basis of the mandate. It's like a central bank of all central banks, they say. That became the function of the International Monetary Fund. But when you talk about trade and money, they are two sides of the same coin. Whatever you do on the trade side will affect the monetary side and vice versa. So it's very important for WTO and the International Monetary Fund, including World Bank, to coordinate more or less if you want to have a sound global economy. Now the whole intention of the uh, so-called Bretton Woods institutions was really to provide a set of rules this time that will govern the behavior of states in regard to money and trade. Why? because they saw that before the Second World War, the excesses of nation states without a regulatory framework on an international plane had even caused, in fact, the war. And they said, you provide a venue for uh, competition for countries around the world to develop, and eventually you will have countries that will be uh, stable and eventually conflict hopefully will not uh, try it. And in a way, if you look at that in the context of a national setting, that exactly is the direction that you would want in a country. When you talk about frameworks, what's the economic framework here? But I think it's a given at that time. It's a free market-based economy. But that will become more and more flexible because as the national economies develop, there are certain specificities on the ground level that may have to adapt to a purely free market based set of principles. So you now have paradigms or models that will talk about development. How do you pursue development you know, in a market based situation that will also look at the impact on the most marginalized sectors of a society? From an international law perspective, a more legal in approach, we now have a set of rules, treaty-based rules, in regard to exchange of goods and services or even uh, your, your currencies. No? And so there are things that you just cannot do on a domestic level without having to take into account the impact on other states. 
So this is, I think, one of the most interesting contribution, uh, contributions from the point of view of international law and practice. And this is where I'd like to emphasize a little bit more. Now, just looking at the IMF's mandate, if you look at the paragraph um, under Article 1, it says, and I quote, to facilitate the expansion and balanced growth of international trade and to contribute thereby to the promotion and maintenance of high levels of employment and real income and to the development of the productive resources of all members as primary objectives of economic policy. That is a provision and I'd like to focus on two very relevant mandates of the IMF that had something to do with the financial obligations of states. There are two provisions I'd like to give emphasis to. That's the freedom for people to freely draw on an equivalent amount that I have contributed to the fund. And to that extent, a peso to a peso, there will be no conditions for it. But oftentimes, countries will need more than what they have initially contributed. And that is where what we call the conditionalities come in. And therefore, you have to abide by that. I will explain the very technical arrangement later on. In the case of uh, the, uh, the mandate of the IMF also, I'd like to mention this uh, very important provision in Article 1 that says it has the mandate to establish a multilateral system of payments in respect of current transactions between members and the elimination of foreign exchange restrictions which hamper the growth of world trade. Again, if you look at the mandate of the IMF in light of WTO also, the principle is that the lesser government is in, or at least the less restrictions you have, to allow the free exchange of goods and services, or in this case, the free movement of payments across the border, then the better for the world economy. The other provision is, says to give confidence to members by making the fund's resources temporarily available to them under adequate safeguards, thus providing them an opportunity to correct mal adjustments in their balance of payments without resorting to measures destructive of national or international prosperity. Now, as I said, it's very tempting for a state that is experiencing economic crisis to adopt very popular, very popular policies, but of course, may be economically damaging in the end. So economists would understand this better, of course. No? It hurts, it hurts to recover. There are people, they call this the bitter pills that you have to take on the short term, but hopefully with a long-term gain for the economy. And so when you need that breathing space, you are given what you might call a facility. You are allowed access to IMF resources, and in very, very basic civil law parlance, that's a loan anyway, but it's called a purchase of currency. It's a very technical, again, uh, procedure, but it really is like a loan. And you're given that window to be able to use up the funds for a certain period of time, hopefully, to be able to cure your balance of payments deficit within a certain period. Freedom for payments and external debt service. Now, I'd like to follow through on that particular uh, provision on current transactions because um, there is also a very important provision in Section 2A of Article 8 of the amended provision of the Articles of Agreement, where it says, no member shall, without the approval of the fund, impose restrictions on the making of payments and transfers for current international transactions. And what does the phrase current international transactions actually mean? Well, before I move to that, I just want to mention that let me refer to even your debts, your loans, no? to, in the case of some of the most in indebted countries before, to private commercial banks. That was the phenomenon at one time. So 
you cannot impose some of these restrictions. You must allow continuous payments. Now, in the case of the Philippines, I just want to flag a case called Gingona versus Paraguay. This is Senator Gingona and Clemente, uh, which challenge uh, the uh, Foreign Borrowings Act of uh, the uh, Philippines at that time, which is a carryover from uh, the Marcos administration. It dealt with the automatic debt service. No? As you know, in every government budget, every year, there is almost always a fraction of the budget that automatically goes to debt service. That has been there for a while, and it is not there without any purpose. And it has a lot of bearing from the point of view of external debt service. Well, the challenge that was made, of course, in Ingona versus Carrage were almost two or three fold. But let me focus on one that says uh, you cannot actually uh, set aside money without a very specific uh, appropriation intended for it. So you have to have a very specific sum of money for a particular purpose. <coughs> now, the automatic debt service, according to them, is undetermined. For each year, it is almost undetermined because it is not appearing there unless, and if you compute, of course, the interest for that year, you will be able to determine it. But until such time, it automatically gets into the budget. What was the argument of uh, Senator Gingwana and Senator Pimenta? Very interesting, because they referred to another provision of the Constitution that says, but the Constitution says, highest budgetary priority must yield it to education. So in the pie, this is what they said. In the pie, every year, the biggest must be given to education. And so when you have a very high, let's say, percentage of debt service uh, appropriated, that violates the principle of the Constitution. Of interest is this cap, almost, by the decision of the Supreme Court. I think this was Justice and Kaiko at the time, where he says, as to whether or not the country should honor its international debt, more especially the enormous amount that has been incurred by the past administration, which appears to be the ultimate objective of the petition, is not an issue that is presented or proposed to be addressed by the court. Indeed, it is more of a political decision of Congress and the executive to determine in the exercise of their wisdom and sound discretion. Does that not refer to the parents, to the other branch of government on this matter? Because they are most in tune with how the international community actually would react to a very radical unilateral decision that they have for government to just put a peg on that service or just not pay. So in that sense, we gave due respect to the decision of Congress and the executive actually to allow the operation of the automatic debt service. After this case, there were attempts almost always from the floor to actually veto the automatic debt service uh, provision. And uh, that has almost always not been allowed. It has always remained that time, and to a certain extent, one may ask, what is the Philippine attitude then in regard to international financial obligations? I think there's respect on the part of the Philippine government. And uh, while there is also great temptation to distinguish certain debts, as they said, like for example, the mothballed nuclear power plant, that has been the subject of uh, a lot of, uh, I think, progressive thinking to just walk away from our obligation. In fact, we have paid it on this point. Stop already because we are fully paid. If one were to look back, however, did we behave in a manner that was consistent with the norm at the time to respect financial obligations? I have not, in fact, tackled, tackled the issue of odious debts because the odious debts in international law had been actually applied in certain situations where countries did not want to pay obligations of previous governments or previous states 
because they did not redound to the benefit of the citizen. I am not tackling that in that perspective. Although there's a World Bank study now that perhaps there might be situations that debts that did not definitely redound to the citizens because of a an authoritarian government and corruption, for example, may actually uh, be allowed to forgive those debts you know, under certain conditions. In the case of the Philippines, and I remember this very clearly, one of the pronouncements made by then President Cory Aquino before the U.S. Congress was respect for international financial obligations. It was probably from the point of view of the progressive groups at the time, something that she should not have said. But there are others who would say, perhaps that was also a message to say, we are going to honor financial obligations because we respect our commitments. It's a very strong commitment to say that we are part of an international community and we know the expectation of the international community. There are still, of course, challenges to this point on how we will deal with those. But if you now look at the way the economy is also coping, at one time with the financial crisis, we are one of those that had a very, very much stable economy, even during the Asian financial crisis. Did we do the right thing, of course, for years? And I think it's a message that successions of administrations have to a certain extent been reading quite well how the international community expects us to cope with crisis. So the term current international transactions, as I had mentioned, would perhaps pertain to all payments due in connection with foreign trade or other current business, including services, normal short-term banking and credit facilities, payments due as interest on loans and net income from other investments, payments of moderate amount for amortization of loans or depreciation of direct investments, etc. Okay. Let me move to balance of payments financing in relation to the doctrine of conditionality and the development of what I call uh, as a very contentious instrument called standby arrangement. When one would like to avail of the resources of a government, uh, of the fund, the International Monetary Fund, because the government is in deep balance of payments deficit, you are allowed to enter into an arrangement. It's called the standby arrangement. It may run from one year, two years, three years. No? The Philippines, I think, has been through a lot of SBAs. We keep on renewing SBAs, no? uh, simply because we continue to have need for IMF assistance for a long time. But now I think we're, we've graduated from that. We don't have an existing SBA anymore. And that bodes well for the economy of poverty if you're off the arrangement. You know? That means you have been able to cope with your, with your balance of payments problems. Now, what is interesting here is the tenor by which the International Monetary Fund would treat in a standby arrangement. Now, from basic international law, if a government enters into an agreement with a state, that from the point of view of international law would be a treaty. If you enter into an arrangement with an intergovernmental organization like the International Monetary Fund, what is theoretically the status of that agreement? Would that have the flavor of an international treaty? Now, there is a decision of the Supreme Court more recently in Bayern versus Romulo that says that when the parties enter into agreements, like two states, it's also up to the parties to characterize the nature of the agreement on whether or not they would want it to go through concurrence by the Senate, you know, for example, as in the United States and the Philippines. So there are certain agreements that may not necessarily have the structure of a treaty, but perhaps executive agreements, you know, lesser of a treaty, but still would have international legal consequence for that compliance. In the case of the IMF, they say, Standby arrangements are not international agreements. That comes from them. And we will try to understand why does the IMF want this characterized 
as a uh, a non-international agreement. The fund also says the fund will pay due regard to the domestic, social, and political objectives, the economic policies, and the circumstances of the members. The reason for that is, uh, for some time, IMF has been criticized, saying that the economic policies or prescriptions that the International Monetary Fund missions would normally uh, recommend uh, would on a short term even uh, affect human rights and even social protection measures of a government. And therefore, in order to avoid that uh, invitation to the IMF of having to impose certain measures that will undermine sovereignty or even uh, human rights principles, the fund makes it a point to say that it will pay due regard to the specific situation of the country. And therefore, as much as possible, the design of an economic policy for purposes of addressing balance of payments uh, issues will be specific to a country. But again, the whole of literature will show that it appears that for several countries in the past, especially in the 70s and the 80s, there has been a consistent uh, straitjacket uh, one size fits for all approach or attitude on the part of IMF. And there will be some flexibility that will happen later on because of the reactions of some countries anyway. But this is very clear from the document of the IMF that it will pay due regard to the domestic and social and political objectives of a country. Now let me go closer to home. This is where I'd like to look at standby arrangement in the context of the constitutions of Ireland and the Philippines. You know, Ireland very recently uh, also had big financial problems and they had to go through an arrangement with the IMF. You know? And uh, I got into a very good uh, discourse uh, or literature that actually tackles the predicament of Ireland. When you approach the International Monetary Fund, for balance of payments financing. There are two stages to this. The first is um, the government will write a letter of intent. Okay? They will say, we are in need of your uh, financing for the following purpose, we explain. And then the IMF now, uh, governing board will respond to you and say, yes, we will allow you for a for an arrangement of one, two, or three years, depending on the need country. That's the first stage to it. Now, for you to be able to get the money, you must have a set of economic policies in place. So you come and say, this is my plan on how the economy will be addressed for the next one to three years. And only after you have done that, that there will be an approval on the part of the fund. Now, when you have to get the money, that is when the transaction begins. The transaction actually is not a lump sum. It will not be given to you in a lump sum. It will be given in tranches. They call it a tranche. No? For every tranche, on a periodic basis, there are monitoring uh, tools for the IMF to actually look at the compliance with state. So, would you imagine that a state submitting itself to an international organization to be monitored when it comes to compliance with economic policies? Where is the difficulty here? What if the state is unable to comply with the economic policies? Then the drawdowns, the tranches, will be stopped for some reason. So you are almost always on a periodic monitoring for that because that is the economic discipline required to be as a country. Now, in the case of Ireland, the second, it's the second set of transactions where you now have to draw, you have to purchase uh, from the fund, let's say, currencies, that will now be the subject of a constitutional issue. As far as the standard arrangement is concerned, um, I think Ireland would not consider it consistent with, let's say, the Fund's position that the standard arrangement is not an international agreement. Therefore, it does not have to go through what we call concurrence. But what one observer has said that 
Perhaps in Article 29.5.2 of the Irish Constitution, um, the, 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 second, the second level of transactions is really what will be applicable. Because the Constitution says in Ireland, the state shall not be bound by any international agreement involving a charge upon public funds unless the terms of the agreement shall have been approved by the Irene. I think this is their lower house, no? and um, but the principal chamber. So it has the equivalent of our concurrence by the Senate. Now, there was an argument uh, explained by one writer. He says that as long as the Irish state did not assume any legal obligations whatsoever, there was no international agreement put in place, and therefore Article 29.5.2 was not applicable. But at the next stage, and that is when you now begin to transact, ask for your punches or drawdowns, the government here uh, would actually be entering into actual purchase transactions and therefore it would be assuming certain obligations on behalf of the state which will turn out to be in need of prior approval. Now how does this uh, ring a bell when it comes to our own constitution? If for example the Philippine government itself uh, would now have to get into a standby arrangement, I think we have consistently practiced almost the same way that the Irish government had done, in a way. In the past, I cannot recall of any standby arrangement that had gone through the concurrence of the Senate. Never have I seen such. So that confirms, in a way, our um, admission that the fund considers it as not an international agreement. However, under Article 7, Section 20, the provision before it, Article 7, Section 21 on treaty concurrence, it says that the president may enter into loans or guarantee uh, international financial obligations in that regard only with the concurrence of the monetary board. But my dilemma there has always been if the president on behalf of the Philippine government and the state enters into a loan agreement with another state, or in this case, with the International Monetary Fund. From the point of view of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and under the definition of what a treaty constitutes there, it is a written agreement entered into between two states no? governed by international law. It fits the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And therefore, I would think from the point of view of international law, that is an international agreement. But the procedure domestically differs. And we have made a distinction between loans on one hand and treaties and other international agreements on the other. So there are two provisions, but from the point of view of international law, I think that we'll have anyway an international uh, agreements happens. But domestically, the process is different. Much the same way here, even if the uh, Irish Constitution says that uh, it is uh, not an international agreement, but you interpret the second set of transactions no? when you begin to have to purchase or actually borrow specific tranches, that will create a binding legal obligation. But is it a treaty or not? Perhaps from their point of view, it is not a treaty domestically, but it will have an international <coughs> treaty status as far as the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is concerned. So here is the summary of what I have so far been discussing for you. And um, if you look at the framework here, this was applied sometime in the 1980s and the 1970s, no? when you had many Sub-Saharan Sub African countries, we also have Latin American countries uh, into this uh, framework. Now let me introduce a number of characters. One is the Paris Club group of creditors and the London Club group of creditors. When you go to the Paris Club group of creditors, this is really composed of your creditor governments. Your creditor governments. Most governments, I remember, is almost give on concession loans, zero interest rate. No? It's almost like an aid. But the 
commercial banks that were exposed to many developing country borrowers, especially in the 70s at the height of the uh, quadrupling of oil prices, no? um, decided to band together just like what you have seen in the private bondholders in the early stages of sovereign debt uh, negotiation before the Second World War. They banded together and they called themselves London the Club. Now there are two distinct, agree two distinct agreements here. On one hand is the Paris Club scheduling agreement where you just basically reschedule. That's all that they do. And anyway, it does not entail much interest. It's almost zero interest. But when you talk about the private commercial banks, they are most exposed and they have depositors in their own countries. And therefore, when you begin to write off debts, that's a no-no from the banking industry. So how do you prevent that situation? <coughs> if you look at the clubs, the clubs only are among the creditors. They are not among the debtors. And they said, you know, if at one time Argentina, Brazil, Mexico come together and we form a debtors club, you could imagine the impact on the world economy. <coughs> but this is how they deal with the debtor. So the debtor goes to Paris at the meeting where they tell the Paris club group of creditors for purposes of rescheduling, this is what we need to do. But before they can even do that, or before they can even restructure their uh, uh, debts with the private group of creditors, you have to have already your IMF standard arrangement. Because that is the seal of good housekeeping. That this country has already talked to the IMF, presented a set of economic policies that eventually will translate to legislation, and that's the only time you will have confidence that you are going to recover within a certain period of time. Now, where is the difficulty here? Legislation may mean increases in taxes. It may mean liberalization, opening your economy. It may also mean budget cuts on certain uh, factors that will not have a quick return on your investment. So this is where the difficulty begins. And this is where national governments will now have to determine how will our citizens cope with this? If our constitution talks about social justice, fundamental rights of our people, protection to the most vulnerable sectors of society, and we have such constitutional mandate, how do we now use this as a set of standards now to look at economic policies? that will have a bearing on a short term, it's painful, but there have to be a long-term gain. Now that's the most difficult for a government. And if a government is not popular enough, it might fall overnight. And there is a literature by a group of German sociologists that I have seen one time, really very, very interesting to study, the so-called vicious cycle of indebtedness where you might at one time have a communist government or you might have a junta, depending on the capacity of a government to be able to implement what we call austerity measures. So there is a very fragile, very fragile situation in the implementation of such adjustment policies. And this is where critics come in. There are stories that in sub-Saharan Africa, some of the poorest countries there, IMF missions actually become secretaries of finance or even central bank owners simply because the country does not have the capacity to even run those economies. <coughs> well, that's, of course, if you would look at it from the point of view of intervention, that's an affront. But what can you do if you want to save the economy? So that has been the other side. So this is the model. And this is the model that has been going on for a long time. So I'll just run through some of the basic principles. Uh, just like in ordinary uh, contract uh, debts, you have to have respect for the rights of creditors. So even among the creditors, they want to be assured that they'll be paid. So they almost always want good behavior on the part of the government. And that means, again, referring to a program that the IMF already has in with the debtor country. Um, you also take into account the legitimate interests of creditors. You have to treat them equally. 
So among the Paris Club group of creditors, you also have to treat them almost equally. Okay? For debts that are actually um, owed to private creditors, there's an entirely different set of uh, norms. And this is where I'd like to bring you with them. But again, I just want to emphasize it. throughout equality and non-discrimination among all creditors. It's a standard set. And as far as private, non-officially guaranteed debt, you have to negotiate it with the private creditors on a different plane. And that is your London club. That is how they negotiate it. So that's the only time that has also reached the level in 78 to a more multilateral framework. So it is recognized as a norm. And again, there is need, on the other hand, to protect the interests of both the debtors and the creditors. You do not want also your debtor to actually close shop. So they have to take into account the reasonableness of payments fees. Now let me go to the private commercial banks, which is very interesting, because this is where they apply very strict. If you're in the private practice, this is really drawn from typical loan, uh, commercial loan uh, agreements. No? where you have a syndicated loan, but what's interesting is that now, that type of loan agreement takes into account IMF. They now say, you still have to go to the IMF because that's the only way we can have confidence that if we restructure your debt, it will infuse new funds to you. Events of default. What is an event of default? If you are unable to maintain your good standing, that can trigger an event of default in a restructuring agreement. Now this is Venezuela. Uh, this is actually the, the closure of my initial research in, back in 1989 when I was wrapping up with my research at the time. The bubble burst for Venezuela. Venezuela is one of the more respectable Latin American countries at the time. It had oil, of course, unlike the other countries there. But in 1989, Venezuela hit the snack, and they had to resort to IMF assistance. So the president sent an economic mission to the IMF uh, in New York for a meeting, and the IMF gave almost the typical prescriptions, short-term austerity measures uh, that needed to be immediately implemented. The mission said the Venezuelan uh, team said, this will be very difficult for the country. But the IMF said, but you have to do it. They went back to Venezuela, and in three days, there were riots in six major cities in Venezuela, leading to about 100 deaths. Why? Because there was a drastic cut on subsidies. Subsidies usually will cover those that the consumers are most dependent on, like uh, energy, Food, for example. In other parts like Middle East, there were subsidies on bread that had to be cut on short term that led to actual protests. So when they went back to the IMF, then the IMF began to realize there might be need to revaluate. And this is where I think uh, credit also should be given to the institution because uh, while it is very difficult to apply you know, policies that may differ from the traditional approaches, it has become more open to new frameworks. So sometime in the 90s, there was the Brady plan. Uh, Secretary of State Baker, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Brady of the United States proposed certain measures that will allow countries to postpone payments. So on interest, you know, um, because as of uh, the time that negotiations are going on, you are not allowed to even postpone payments on either interest or principles. But then they began to relax that. But the more telling was, of course, the uh, case of highly indebted poor countries. It has become a reality that many countries can no longer service their debts. They cannot even pay the principles anymore. And therefore, there was a realization from the point of view of the international community that perhaps for highly indebted poor countries, we may just have to write off the debts, forgive them. And that happened finally. And this is 
I think, where the IMF has, to a certain extent, been convinced. Uh, unfortunately, we are not in the list. That means we are not highly indebted country and not poor in that sense. No? Um, because, in a way, our economy had been able to cope with this. So that became possible in the HIPC initiative. What did the countries do where they had some savings? They channeled it to health, education, and other development outcomes. And that is where they were given much breathing space. Now, let me go to the Asian financial crisis. The Asian financial crisis was not a typical balance of payments problem according to the IMF and the other economists around the world. They say, if you look at the situation, while there may have been allegations, for example, of corruption no, or internal mismanagement, uh, that is not really in the class of uh, developing country borrowers' uh, problems in the 70s and the 80s. Besides, you are looking at East Asia, where the action is economically, where you have some of the most robust and fast developing economies, Korea, Malaysia, then it means was centered, of course, in Thailand. And so when this happened, there were some resistance on the part of Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines to resort to IMF at the time. It was only Korea that went through a very, very rigid standby arrangement. And this is where I think IMF began to differ in approaching problems of uh, some of the uh, economies in Asia. Because now, it is not the typical IMF balance of payments financing issue. What they did was to cover even trade liberalization more expansively, privatization issues, foreign investment, pension reforms, Public, secure, public sector austerity measures. These are not the normal uh, structural adjustment loans program. So it combined both structural and corporate and good governance, which is very interesting from the point of view of financial uh, law. Now comes the last stage, the European debt crisis, the country. Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, and Spain. Could you have imagined that? We're back to pre-World War I situation. We started off with Europe, we now end again with Europe. And in fact, our central bank governor uh, offered to join other develop, developing countries to share a certain amount of their reserves, in fact, to extend to a bailout package for European debt. I. When I heard that, I said, what an act. <laughs> Hard act to follow now. There were those who criticized. But from the point of view of good global citizenship, I think it was a good gesture. It was a very good gesture in that point. When at one time you were in dire need, to Molusina. Why not? And these are some of the best developing partners also we've had in the past. No less than Spain, of course, was sentimentally still very much attached to us as a people. But Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Spain. Now, Greece was interesting because there was a government initially that implemented the austerity measures, but actually did not sustain the capacity and fell. And you had a new government. What is of interest now is the development of two mechanisms in Europe. The one called financial stability facility, and the other one is the financial stabilization mechanism. Now, this is actually in the model of the IMF standby arrangement. Why did they come up with this? Because there was no framework in place for them. It shook the heads of uh, the, uh, the, the Europeans to grapple for a mechanism. And so within their own treaty-based rules, they tried to find a way. How do we justify this? No? How do we justify this mechanism? But first, by way of distinction, the first facility, which was initially uh, implemented, the EFSF, 
was actually funded by Euroland members. In the other stabilization mechanism, subsequent to that, you now have the participation IMF. So IMF came in. Because IMF for, is really not most welcome in Europe. No? Yeah. They don't want that because you have a very proud, integrated economy and say, what is IMF going to do here? We have another layer anyway of uh, governance in Europe. No? And because of the experience of developing country power, they said, we don't want to be given the one-size-fits-all remedy uh, for economic uh, change. It's the second one that will now become permanent. So you will now have a mechanism in place. This is perhaps the equivalent of a standby arrangement in a European setting. So that's what I said. It's the standby arrangement with the following features. So what's the procedure? A member experiencing severe financial disturbance will prove that it is in need of the fund, that the disturbance is beyond its control. Next is that the member could not by itself raise money. Next is the submission of an economic and financial adjustment program. Sounds like the standby arrangement. And finally, you now have more close monitoring by key institutions in EU, such as the courts, the court of auditors, and the European Anti-Fraud Office. Why did they have that in mind? Because they realized these countries that got into that problem, uh, particularly Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, were what we call peripheral countries. Peripheral because when they were allowed to enter the European Union, their economies were practically not in the same class as Germany and the rest of Europe. But they were allowed nonetheless by Germany, hoping that they will be competitive enough to catch up. But actually, when you enter a place like for one time you were perhaps in one part of the metropolis and then you go to Forbes Park, you know, then you begin to be tempted to leave the way those people live, right? Forbes <laughs> name. So I must have a Mercedes Benz, I must have. When before you only had, what, Kia, no? Kia. <laughs> Sorry, huh? So Greece, Portugal, Ireland. The peripheral countries at the time. But, you know, you look at Italy and Spain, they're the more established ones. They were also hard hit. And thanks to the United States, because that's what really triggered it in part, aside from the peripheral situation that they had at the time. But it was really triggered by the 2000 to 2008 block in the United States. And this is, um, again, from a legal perspective of interest that I found in one of the literature recently. There is a justification that they had to do. So far, what we have been discussing since the first hour is that there was no clear mechanism in place internationally. Because before, there were no international institutions before the Second World War, like IMF, World Bank, or WTO. But come the Second World War, after that, we have a more distinct set of rules. But still, the way they dealt with it was on an ad hoc basis. Simply because you have to respect the sovereignty of states and the rest. They have to consent to certain procedures. But now in the European setting, there is a provision in the Treaty of the European Union, Article 122, Paragraph 2, which says, where a member state is in difficulties or is seriously threatened by natural disasters or exceptional circumstances beyond its control. The Council on a proposal from the Commission may grant under certain conditions union financial assistance to member state concerned. The exceptional circumstances test in the provision has been interpreted to cover, and I quote, serious deterioration in the international and economic environment. What about the peripheral member states where there has been, according to one set of studies about Greece, Greece actually concealed certain facts to the Union, which actually caused or aggravated their economic situation. First, mismanagement, pure and simple. 
there was concealment. But if they contributed to that, would that have been exceptional circumstances? It looks like under the European Union practice now, applying it to the peripheral countries, they would now consider that also as an exceptional circumstance. So the inducement of the crisis from the United States down to the peripheral countries would now be considered as one of those. So this is interesting development today in Europe. And so far in the region we don't have in Asia, we will still have to rely on the IMF standby arrangements right now. But this is, for me, uh, uh, the latest development on the sovereign debt negotiation. Now, let me end. Sorry to have exceeded a few minutes. Um, I just want to make the observation that uh, as far as sovereign debt negotiations are concerned, we have seen remarkable changes from the time the IMF was constituted. To a certain extent, it had become more sensitive to what happened to developing country borrowers and now with the plight of what we call peripheral countries in Europe. The second is that you have new classes of debtor states. You have developed states now, okay? the Forbes type of uh, debtors. And finally, austerity measures have now become transparent. They resort to parliament first before you even implement the economic policies. Um, this now becomes sort of the, uh, the standard. Whereas before it was from top to bottom, today what they do is in order that the economic policies should be accepted by the people, you have to have more transparency because the people have a stake into making a decision that will affect their lives. So there's no more secrecy in so far as transactions are concerned. And finally, there is a lot of literature now that says social protection and economic human rights must be given precedence here. We cannot ignore the fact that children will be deprived of access to milk. For example, breastfed milk, no, but I think milk substitutes. <laughs> but basic services, basic needs of people will now have to become standard uh, norms to deal with when you now have to implement economic policies. And there are standards like the universal human rights principles, you have the economic, social, cultural rights, and even civil, political, and economic rights that we may actually have to balance. You cannot sacrifice governance on one hand for the sake of instilling austerity measures. We must respect fundamental rights on one hand and also respect at the same time the right of the state to survive by implementing reasonable economic policies, but in the end, with respect for fundamental human rights. That's where I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Candelaria, for that very informative lecture. Speaking of standards, you've definitely set a high standard for the other deans of the other the other law schools. So they're gonna have to do really well in their own public lectures. So um, students, now is your chance to put the dean on recitation. So <laughs> the floor is now open for questions. Um, there are microphones there in the middle of the Augustisha. Please feel free to ask your questions. Thank you. Actually, I brought the class cards. No? <laughs>
morning, um, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so Dean, um, I remember the case of um, <laughs> of the the WTO case, sir. Um, justice. Um, in that in that case, um, um, a significant uh, observation by the court, which I think saved the 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 case, is really the the five year, I think, twenty year um, leeway given by by the WTO to the Philippines. Um, Example, um, justice indeed. Um, if, for example, we we prove to the the WTO that we can still comply, um, given the five year or the twenty year leeway, can we say that we can still implement the provision of the of the WTO in that regard? I think you have just put the ponente to a recitation. <laughs> <laughs> and I defer to the uh, I think it's very difficult to be in Ateneo. <laughs> I'm only from a four months university. <laughs> Although raised in standard by the present being who comes from the best law school. <laughs> in that way. <laughs> but I will answer that later on when my turn comes. So I think uh, what you also have to look at as far as the economic institutions are concerned, they have uh, what we call special legal regimes, no? that's in lehen specialis. No? Uh, before you even resort to a remedy outside the uh, Articles of Agreement or outside the uh, WTO, uh, let's say charter, you actually have to look at the mechanisms with it. In the case of the IMF, non-compliance with economic policies will allow you to resort to consultations because they don't want you to do unilateral actions. So they give you that opportunity. It's like an exhaustion of domestic remedies. Exhaust the remedies within the institution before the institution can even accuse you of having violated international obligations. Many borrowers have had to deal with uh, years and years of uh, you know indebtedness and also economic uh, privation, and the tolerance is much higher compared to those countries here. So we now look at levels of economic standards. No, pag nawalan ng isang poche doon sa Europe, no disaster. Dito ni walang poche yung tao mo hahanap na sa sakyan. No, we we'll have to take the rise in uh, gasoline or, for example, uh, cost of transportation. It really deals on the non-legal responses of the community. But on the level of commitments, I think uniformity applies to human rights standards. What applies to European citizens also should apply to those in the uh, heavily indebted countries. It's just that on the basis of the resources available, that's when you have to have proportionate, I think, response. Because obviously, the pie in Europe is still bigger compared to the pie in the developing country borrowers. But the bottom line is there are fundamental rights that will have to be respected, whether you're a rich bar, uh, that or in that sense, or uh, in a rich country, or let's say, uh, a very poor uh, developing country. So it should be the same, I think, in that sense. No? I don't know if I was able to address your concern in that regard, but I think it refers more to the economic uh, human rights uh, in that regard. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Sir, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is one of the clarificatory questions, sir, regarding um, one of your conclusions. One of your conclusions uh, was that uh, uh, IMF now has had uh, evolving standards in sovereign debt driven renegotiations. Particularly, you said that uh, they are being now uh, more sensitive to their debt or countries. Uh, I just want to ask how uh, you arrived at that conclusion. Uh, 
how and how you reconcile that with the fact that they are now applying uh, more conditionalities or deconditionalities have expanded in school. How does uh, how do they become more sensitive when the conditionalities have um, entered realms which are not uh, which they have not entered before? What, how does that give more leeway to the better companies? Okay, I think it's more or less a function of how. Uh, the causes of uh, indebtedness had evolved through the years also. Because now they have realized that we, some of the causes of indebtedness may actually be attributed to mismanagement you know, and not pure balance of payments deficit. So they have to address that. That's why they go into issues of governance now. Um, that, in a way, I think is responsive to the conditions uh, that most developing, most countries now are going through in terms of, uh, I think, uh, what you might call uh, adjustment. No? So you will have to see the history uh, in order to realize that the IMF actually is responding to certain ground issues. Now, there are still macroeconomic uh, policies that will have to be undertaken, but definitely will have to affect certain rights, like workers' rights. No? In Korea, the immediate reaction of the workers was, of course, to renounce IMF austerity measures because there were layoffs. No? So that again is a direct bearing on the lives of citizens. But what the IMF, I think, and other economists are saying is that there are certain short-term measures. But hopefully that on the long term, as they say always, on the long term, when the country recovers, then you'll be able to adjust uh, the standards of living accordingly. But there are definitely going to be hurts along the line, along the line, and that is where I think, looking at the history of IMF involvement, they have been trying their best. No, they have been trying their best. Uh, thank you. <coughs> ah, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Transaction. Uh, the arrangement is really one between the fund and the government to say, we will make the facility available for you for a certain period of time. Yes, the actual drawdowns, when you now have, it's like a credit line, when for the next quarter you will get 25,000, 25 million. Next 25. That's a specific transaction. And that is what makes it interesting in the analysis that says, in the second stage, that definitely is like an ordinary uh, contract under civil law. In fact, the analysis was under civil law by that uh, person from the Bank of Romania. It's a civil law country, and they were trying to imagine, does this not have the effect of a bilateral contract already? So that's the distinction made. But in the arrangement, IMF says there should not be any contractual flavor even given to that. So sir, it will be trouble if it will become a contract. Because, sir, well, in, from the in, point of view of government, because from the point of view of government and the IMF, that will be basis to say there's a breach of an international agreement that will allow the other party, like the IMF, to go to the ICJ. But you don't want to have economic issues being settled by the ICJ. It's not the same way that we say the Supreme Court must defer to the political branches of government, like the uh, executive when it comes to matters of uh, the economy. Mm -hmm. sir, just, uh, so, sir, because the way the, the law was worded, sir, contractual provisions should should be will be avoided. It's not there should be no contractual flavor. You cannot impute a contractual flavor to the SBA. Uh, but sir, it's not mandatory, so <coughs> it could happen. No, from the point of view of the IMF, that's their position. Just final question, sir. Sir, do you think do you agree with, with for example, there are people saying that the, the constitution should be amended to be more responsive to economic, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, issues, economic uh, developments in, in, in the global. In, in the global. Well, that's a very contentious uh, issue now sir, because sir. there is a you know there's a mind that says you know there are restrictions obviously when it comes to foreign ownership you know, that uh, would have encouraged if you had a more open uh, let's say uh, ownership provision right 
Personally, for me, I think there's enough in the Constitution now that will allow us to progress. If also we would do better housekeeping within the uh, branches of government. By itself, uh, and I still believe that the Constitution as it stands now will have to be maximized in its impact. Of course, it's a policy decision if we say, do you want to go from Primera, Segunda, Tercera? Then opening it up when it comes to ownership probably will change. But there are other repercussions also that we have to take into account. The impact on the other sectors of the uh, of the government and also on the part of the citizens. No? Um, but for me, I think we have to maximize the provisions of the Constitution. No? And there's enough leeway for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Jeremy. Professor Gakula. Hi, I'm Hi. Just a couple of comments and then a few minutes for comments. The, the first comment uh, I actually wanted to say you were asked, the letters are all actually the, the, the answering sovereign debts. And um, in fact, one of, for me, one of the more significant issues, particularly for developing countries, um, which I think they missed, but not many people brought it up was the fact that when um, Strauss Khan was actually removed from office, there was a move for, for a developing country person to, to replace him, which I think um, a lot of the Asian countries and the Philippines um, frankly missed. Um, there has been a tradition of having an American for the WTO, IMF, European, and in the end it was a, a European who replaced uh, Strauss Khan, Christine Lagarde. Um, I feel that next time there, there should be an election for the replacement for the IMF. Uh, I think there should be a strong, aggressive move uh, uh, a nation, and hopefully Philippines. We have the Vietnam, Kese, and you have see Babu Rapalco. The second comment I'd like to make is, uh, and this is also for the benefit of the students here, the three heads of the economic groups, I don't know if anybody actually noticed, Christine Lagarde, Pascal Lamy, Robert Zerek, they're all lawyers. So there's a shift right now in the way that the legal profession is actually run. Um, there is the probability here that you may not have, or at least have a legal profession that's actually far different from the legal profession that Dean Tadalai or perhaps I have. Uh, and there's a greater more flexibility because of the fact that, well, there's a, there's a different need as far as the legal profession is concerned. The third comment is the one actually which is in response to your comment. And this is again for the benefit of the students. Um, Dean Cadillac was talking about the non-unilateral action of the taking of Einstein for sovereign debts. Um, and he made a reasoning on the fact that, well, it is part of what being a good international citizen is about. And I think it's no secret between Dean and myself that there's actually a personal profound difference in, in philosophy in that one. Um, to put it as inelegantly as I can, I frankly don't care for being an international good citizen. Um, I believe that if every um, action that the state should take, is that the state should take it from the basis of national interest and not with the viewpoint of caring whether or not the other countries would be happy with what we see. Having said that, the effect will probably be the same. I believe that coming from the perspective of purely sovereign and national interest, it will not be the interest of the country to actually not answer for its debts. Uh, having said that, that's it. Thank you very much and congratulations to Justice Mundi. I respect your opinion, Jeremy. I am surprised with you when it comes to the China situation. <laughs> Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much for your very incisive remarks and questions. The liberty of our people, the judiciary's strict adherence to scrutinizing the actions of government in regard to that, because government was not instituted to be cruel to the people. Government was instituted so that the people's interests can be given the best expression. However, in matters of the economy, which we lawyers do not really understand, except for Dean Candelacca, we should defer to the political branches of government because the political branches of government is composed of um, officials elected by the people for that purpose, of freeing them from disease, from poverty, from disability. And so therefore, we lawyers and we in the judiciary must be fair as much as possible. <coughs> as I said, uh, Dean Candelaria brought up the topic immediately to the international level. 
<clears throat> Before I graduated from the Supreme Court, I convened an international forum on liberty and prosperity as my valedictory conference. That was held in October of 2006. I graduated in December of 2006. And I invited the justices and lawyers from all over the world, 300 of them, to the Philippines. And we discussed the international impact of liberty and prosperity. That conference was assisted by not only the World Bank, but even national uh, agencies like the Canadian International Development Agency, the Japan International Development Assistance Agency, even the Netherlands uh, uh, Development Institute. And we discussed liberty and prosperity on a global basis. The Canadian Chief Justice, um, McLaughlin, uh, um, Beverly, Beverly McLaughlin came all over uh, from her uh, station in Ottawa to the Philippines. And she was enamored by the theme of liberty and prosperity that she said, please add the phrase under the rule of law. Liberty and prosperity under the rule of law. She intended to stay for only three days, but she was so, uh, she fell in love with the Philippines, especially with Ateneo de Manila, that she stayed four more days. And Ateneo de Manila appreciated her so much, Ateneo gave her a doctoral degree in law honoris causa here at Ateneo. So you have a co-alumnus, the Chief Justice of Canada by the name of Beverly McLaughlin, who holds a doctoral degree from the Ateneo de Manila. Dean Candelaria, as I said, spoke of liberty and prosperity in the international sense, but uh, prefaced it by my uh, ponencia in Tanyala versus Angara, subject also of a uh, question. I know that that case could provoke a lot of controversy in terms of how to interpret the Constitution. It did evoke a lot of controversy in the Supreme Court because at that time, the economic paradigm was economic protectionism. We must first protect our own before patronizing foreign products. We must bar the entry of foreign goods and services in the Philippines in order to protect our own um, uh, goods and services. We call that national economic protectionism. That was the economic paradigm before. However, <clears throat> In the world, uh, that became obsolete because uh, interdependence among the states became the norm, as independence among individuals in a society was important. In a society, we sometimes surrender some of our individual liberties in order to enjoy the benefits of society. How? Sometimes you need to surrender part of your money for protection. You live in a not to, not to even mention the government. You, know, you pay taxes to the government for that purpose. But sometimes you want to live in an enclave. One uh, typical example, uh, uh, an extreme example, would be to live in Forbes Park. Apart from paying your taxes, you also have to pay association dues because you need extra protection from security guards. You have a gated village. So you pay a little bit more. So you surrender part of your money a little bit more because you want to enjoy more protection. Now, it's the same in the world. You have to surrender some of your rights in order to enjoy some other rights. You <coughs> compete in the entire world. In the same manner that you compete locally, states compete internationally. And it has been determined that uh, to do that, we must break down tariffs we must bring down taxes that impede the free flow of goods and services. And so the realm of the regulation, privatization, and uh, um, uh, getting the government out of business became the norm. 
Some of us may disagree with that, in fact, because we say, well, we must take care of our own first. But if you take care of your own, then foreign countries will not buy from you either. You become isolated. Now, almost all the countries in the world adopt this international, have adopted this international norm, including China, Russia, and the heretofore totalitarian and socialist states. Very few have isolated themselves like North Korea. And North Korea, as you know, is so isolated it cannot trade with the world. It trades only with the very few countries. Anyway, going back to Tanyada versus Angara, the adherence of the Philippines to the World Trade Organization was ratified by the Philippine Senate. There was a big debate in the Senate, but eventually they were able to secure two-thirds vote, and the uh, agreement was ratified by the Philippine Senate. The minority then, at that time, led by a number of senators, Senator Angala, Senator Arroyo, I remember, they went to the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the Philippine adherence to the WTO agreement. <coughs> uh, that case was filed in the court before I arrived, but uh, the ponente was my predecessor. I took his place, and so I inherited his cases. That's the, the way it is in the Supreme Court. The, <coughs> a new justice inherits the old cases undecided by the justice who retired and whom he succeeded. And so I uh, got into that uh, case. You know, the, the WTO agreement consists of 34 volumes, 36 volumes, about 300, 400 pages thick. So I had to pour over this. Most of them, of course, most of these volumes were about what the different countries are, are shedding, what tariffs are being reduced, what, ta what tariffs are being abolished. Uh, every country that uh, that join the World Trade Organization. My important thing is, will this trade pass scrutiny in, uh, under our constitution? You know, our constitution has a lot of nationalistic provisions, and even now are being challenged. In fact, some uh, senators and congressmen want even to amend the constitution to remove these nationalistic provisions. But that's not here or there. The point is, the Constitution could have been interpreted strictly and we would have avoided or we could have declared unconstitutional our adherence to the World Trade Organization. It could have been justified by a strict scrutiny and a strict interpretation in favor of uh, the nationalists in our midst. But I thought as Ponente that I would defer to the political branches of government. I said the judiciary will not determine the advisability, the wisdom, or the viability of whether the regulation is good for the people or not, whether privatization is good for the economy or not. That is for the political branches to determine the president and Congress. That's what their job is. Our job as jurists, in fact, our job as lawyers, is not to be economists. Our job is to determine whether our constitution has been violated or not. And in doing that, we have to have a certain philosophy. Do we do it ourselves? In other words, while I may have my private opinion that the regulation is not good, I cannot let that prevail in my decision. I must let the political branches of government determine that. After all, if their decision is bad, our people will reject them and change the policy. And so far, our people have not rejected them. And I'll tell you that at that time, the justices were also conservative. But they did not also quite understand the meaning of all these new paradigms. And it took me a lot of time to convince them. When finally the deliberations were over and I wrote the decision, I had to grapple with a lot of uh, difficult provisions that you must have studied in constitutional law and in political law. And 
of the 15 justices, 14 who, who I uh, aside from me, majority just wrote in my credential in the result. I'm a little insulted because after trying my best to study in three minutes, they would say in the result. Not the majority of my colleagues, I remember about 11 of them, 11 of the 14 wrote in the result. Meaning, I agree with your uh, conclusion, but I do not know about your results. So I complained to Chief Justice Narbasa at that time. I said, you know, Chief, you let us re deliberate on this. If they don't want to agree with me, they must say so. And we will debate again. But I cannot accept a decision that says 11 of my colleagues say in the result. It's an insult on the Corinthian because you are right in your conclusion, but not necessarily in your reasons. I would like them to state why they do not agree with my reasons. So we read the debate, but nobody would say why I was wrong. So in that case, I said, you must either write your dissent, your separate opinion, or you concord fully with me. <laughs> and that's what happened. But two, I think, retain their in the result. Did you, did you come? <laughs> I talked with the two of them, I remember two, but they said, no, we, we will not say our reasons, we will just say the result. I said, that's unconstitutional, because the Constitution says that a decision must state the facts and the law upon which it is based. I said, I'm not writing my opinion, they said. No, I said, you are voting and you are expressing an opinion. You must state the basis. Still, they did not want to. <laughs> So I said, you'll be impeached because you're <laughs> really <laughs> But nobody dared to question in the resort uh, uh, votes up to now. It's still my position, by the way. That just has to state why they dissent or why they say in the resort. They cannot just say in the resort, period. Now, <clears throat> that's so much for Tanyada versus Angara. Now, the, uh, if I may respond a little bit on the peaks, the peaks, the countries that are in trouble in Europe. Peaks, P for Portugal, I for Ireland, another I for Italy, G for Greece, and S for Spain. As the, uh, as uh, the, uh, in uh, Candelaria said some of them are peripheral states. Their economies are very small. So even if they collapse, they will probably not affect too much the European Union. But two are very big, Spain and Portugal. I, repeat, I remember specifically Spain. You know, when I was Chief Justice, I visited Spain to conclude a treaty whereby we did not really a treaty. I remember a memorandum of agreement, not a treaty to be ratified by the Senate, uh, an exchange of uh, uh, culture and historical information between the Supreme Court of Spain and the Supreme Court of the Philippines. After all, I said that much of our, many of our laws, the Code of uh, Commerce, the Civil Code, the Penal Code, were basically Spanish in origin, and therefore we should exchange more with Spain than with other countries. Anyway, when I was there, the Prime Minister, who, called, who wanted to himself to be called President, invited us, my wife and I, and several others, to lunch. Uh, Zapatero was his name. Now he's no longer there. He was a young president. He was only 44 at that time. He was really a Prime Minister, but he wanted to be called President. So we were seated beside each other. And he said, uh, how are you? I said, how are you? In Spanish. Uh, we had an interpreter between us. He understood English, but didn't want to answer in English. I didn't understand Spanish, so I could not, I couldn't uh, answer in Spanish. But anyway, we had an interpreter. And uh, he said, I, I'm sorry that uh, uh, I'm not very formal. You see, he said, uh, I'm not. He, 
he uh, was just attired in uh, ordinary uh, uh, ordinary suit. No? It was not for you know, it was not really black and white. It was not formal. And in the invitation that he said, he said no long dresses for ladies. Normally in these uh, state events, the ladies wear long attire. I said, why, Excellency, don't you like uh, formalities? Well, he said, I would rather have meetings with the ordinary people and act like an ordinary citizen. Oh, I said, you're pro-poor. Oh, he said, no, I'm not pro-poor. There are no more pro poor people in Spain. <laughs> you know, he said, the Spanish economy is the eighth largest in the world. Oh, I was so impressed, you know. No more poor people in Spain. That was in 1906. And now it's 2012, and Spain is one of the peaks. One of the countries in Europe that is uh, lagging. In fact, 28% unemployment in Spain. Can you imagine that? In the United States, it's only 8%, and the people are already rioting. In Spain, it's 28% unemployment, and many of their banks are tottering. They have extreme difficulty. And yet, in 2006, the president said there are no more poor people in Spain. By the way, he was very frank. I said, Mr. President, as additional side uh, comments, I noticed that my, uh, my uh, uh, equivalent, he did not invite, the pre meaning the Chief Justice of Spain was not invited in the occasion. He said, yes, I did not invite him. Oh, I was surprised. Why did you not invite the Chief Justice of Spain in this luncheon? He said, I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you like him? You know, he uh, arrested, he issued warrants of arrest several Chinese businessmen. And President Hu Jintao called me up. Mr. President Zapatero, please release my uh, businessmen. If you cannot release them just like that, please grant them bail so that they can enjoy temporary liberty. So he said, you know, the president of China called me up, so I had to call the chief justice. He said, you know, the, I called the chief justice of uh, Spain. His name was Santiago, Hernando Santiago. We have a problem, Mr. Chief Justice. What is it, Mr. President? Uh, the, chief, the president of uh, China is pleading that you release the Chinese businessman. And you know what he said? What, Mr. President? No, I will not release them. Because under our laws, they're not available. And I was so embarrassed, he said, because uh, what would I do? Oh, but the relationship of Spain with China was, uh, was uh, being shaken. But anyways, I don't like it. So I said, well, who else don't you like? Uh, the Pope. <laughs> Why don't you like the Pope? He's coming tomorrow. He was, supposed, he was coming to Spain the following day. Yes, he said he's coming to Barcelona, but I'm not going there to welcome him. I said, why? Well, he doesn't like me, so I don't like him. <laughs> why don't you like him, Excellency? Well, he said, because, you know, I uh, sponsored the law in Spain allowing gay marriages. There's now a law during his time it was passed, allowing gay marriages in Spain. And you know, during my, uh, my term of only four months, he was only four months uh, president at the time we met, I already was a sponsor in the wedding of 8,000 gay people. <laughs> anyway, that's an aside. <laughs> you see, ups and downs in the world, in this, in this world of liberalization and regulation, one day a very progressive country could go down and a very, a very poor country could go up. An example would be Korea. Korea is now a first world country. Uh, my wife and I were there, uh, what was that, last year? Last year, about May last, no, this year. Early this year. Uh, April this year we were there and we landed at the Kimpo International Airport, a very modern, airport, huge airport, maybe 10 hectares in size, just the terminal. And we crossed a bridge, 
the longest bridge we have ever crossed. It's 28 kilometers long. It connects the island of Pichon, where the airport was, to another island called, they think, Songha. We're then developing a new city. They built a bridge across the sea of 28 kilometers long, and we passed it. It took us 20 minutes to cross the bridge. Can you imagine? And uh, we met there some of the biggest businessmen there, the president of Samsung, president of Kia, president of Samsung, a huge conglomerate. But what I'm saying is, it's true. Korea is now a first world country. And yet, it was devastated not only by World War II, but by a Korean war that uh, divided them. And still now it's threatening them another war. North Korea was it's just a few kilometers from Seoul. We went to the border and we were shown a, um, a long, long tunnel that the North Koreans built that uh, troops, soldiers could cross to South Korea, but the South Koreans <laughs> discovered it in time and closed it. Now it's a tourist attraction. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> the, um, the EU austerity program is like the austerity program that was imposed on us when we were under IMF uh, tutelage. No. We're no longer under IMF tutelage now. We have graduated from that. But some countries in, um, in Europe, particularly some of the peaks, in fact, all the peaks, I think, are under IMF tutelage now and they will have to go through austerity measures. You know, the first thing we do when we have problems is we spend in the country. That's the Keynesian theory of economics. You want to progress, you must grow, you borrow and spend in order that the economy can be spirit. Whereas in a family we say, if we are poor, we tighten our belt. It's a different thing. Anyway, we will not go into that deeply, so it, is, uh, it is the work of, um, uh, it was the lecture of Dean uh, Candelari. Suffice it to say that I'm thankful to all of you for coming today and gracing this occasion. I was just commenting to Chief Justice Davide that by the uh, kind and nature of questions that were raised, the Ateneo student is really far above the ordinary. Marami, marami, salamat po. Thank you, Chief Justice Frank, and for your very honest and heartwarming remarks. Um, so before we close, uh, I'd like to call the advisor of the Ateneo Center for International Economic Law, Attorney Abad. Um, to present our token of appreciation to our guests today. Okay, uh, bear with us one more moment no? uh, just to uh, show our appreciation to our special guests, especially to former Chief Justice Pamaniban. Uh, I just wanted to make special mention on CJ Art that uh, almost 20 years ago, also with Chito, we gathered in Tagaytay to uh, envision social economic transformation through reforms under the Ramos administration. And it's been, it's been a while, no? And I just realized that uh, you have actually lived what we talked about, and now you've uh, crystallized it in this concept of liberty and prosperity. And I think um, maybe the, the students don't realize how important actually Tanyada versus Angara case is. Um, it's our standard reading now in the International Economic Law class. Uh, and I think it, it speaks a lot of uh, where we're headed. So we promise that uh, beyond this event, we will endeavor, you know, especially through our new organization, the Center for International Economic Law, to really articulate and flesh out the whole concept of liberty and prosperity and this new paradigm that, uh, well, it's actually uh, old paradigms that have to be constantly, you know, fought for. You know, this liberty and prosperity will only be one. 
that way. And we thank you very much for the generosity and for giving us this sort of this uh, jump start, so to speak. We work very closely with you, sir. So uh, your fans, uh, former Chief Justice, are here to give uh, tokens, very simple tokens of appreciation, commemorative uh, coffee table book of the schools, uh, celebrating 75 years of the Ateneo Law School. Our, uh, from our law journal uh, people, the first issue, I think the latest issue, uh, or the most recent issue. And I think there's a slim fit t-shirt uh, that's been uh, inserted in between because uh, you guys are such uh, modern thinkers. <laughs> so first of all, we'd like to present token to, uh, of course, our guest of honor and uh, our, our benefactor through the program of uh, former Chief Justice Art Panganiban. Then, of course, I have to make mention of, uh, I think it was the chairman of the bar exams when I passed. When we passed, no, money, okay? And uh, I thought it was a hair-raising moment, no? Fortunately, uh, I think Professor Jokot de Jos was working for you, sir, no? Uh, and he actually, uh, well, uh, I, won't, I won't reveal any. He sort of, uh, I guess, uh, gave us a heads up no? that uh, we could breathe easy, uh, I think, the uh, the night before. But uh, former uh, Chief Justice Hilario Tamide, uh, thank you very much for being with us, honoring us. Thank you very much. Mabuhay kayong lahat.